5, verse 9. But before we get to that, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Please help us to have a, as much as we love your word now, help us to love it even more. As much as we live by your word now, help us to live by your word even more. Help us, as much as we talk to others about your word, help us to talk to others about your word even more. Wherever we're at with you and your word, Lord, please grow us. Grow us in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ and of your word. Help us to rightly handle your word. And Lord, through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, take your word and use it to make us and mold us like Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. In light of all this amazingness, right, Paul's been talking about the amazingness of the gospel and how it's glorious and how it was foreshadowed in the Old Testament and it was a glory that was seen in Moses in a temporary kind of glory, a lesser glory, so to speak, but that it would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ and oh, it's so glorious and oh, it's unending and oh, it's perfect and oh, it's just amazing and we have this eternal destiny because of it. And this is what we preach and this is what we do. And so what do we do in light of all this? That's the next part of 2 Corinthians 5. So in light of all this wonderful good news of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, what do you do with it? What now, right? You believe it, you hear it, you believe it, then what? And that's what he's getting to here. So says in verse 9, So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. And the him there is Christ. Whether you're at home or away, and remember he was talking about to be at home in the body or to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So whether you're walking in this life or whether you're with the Lord in spirit now, your aim is to please him. That's what you do. Somebody says, I believe in Jesus Christ. I have faith in him. Now what? Make it your aim to please him. That's the easy, easy answer, right? That's the elevator answer. When you only got a couple seconds before you get to the, the next floor and the door is open, you need a short, quick, concise answer. What do you do now after you've put your faith in Christ? You make it your aim to please him. Because that covers everything, doesn't it? You make it your aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So just stopping there, we, since what we do right now has eternal consequences, we want to make sure that our goal is to please God. There are eternal consequences. So, and there is an eternal God who will judge. And we're going to explain the difference between Believers before the judgment seat of God and unbelievers, right? There's a big difference. But because of all this truth in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and because we have the knowledge that God's word is true, and because God's word tells us that there is eternal consequences, it makes sense that our aim should be to please that God who judges and who deals out those eternal consequences. You, you report to headquarters. You report to headquarters. You, you do not care what anybody else thinks of you, okay? You don't care what anybody else thinks of you. Your job is to please Christ. He's who you report to. You report to no one else. You focus on pleasing him, and I guarantee you everything else will work out. But he's who you report to. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks of you. Make it your goal to please Christ. Make that your ambition. Don't have any other ambition. Make that your first ambition. What we talked about in the reading just a few moments ago. Make that your first ambition. Strive for that. That That is something most excellent to strive for. That is something godly to strive for. And again, sometimes we need that, right? Sometimes we need to kind of be able to understand something deep and, and powerful, but in a, in a shorthand kind of way or a shorthand kind of formula. And the shorthand formula is make it your aim to please God. What should I do? And you can use that all the time. Hey, I got to make a decision about what I'm going to do with work. What should I do? Immediately, you should be thinking, what would please God? 
Out of these two, two areas or these two options, or maybe you have 12 options, but out of those options, which option would yield the most results most pleasing to God? Right? There's your answer. There's your direction. There's your compass. Or, um, I don't know if I should say this or not say this. What's more pleasing to God? So you use that as your formula. You keep it in your back pocket and you pull it out every time you need to make a decision or anytime you're not sure of what to do. You pull that out and you say, well, my, my aim is to please God. So, so what would please him here? What would please him most? Whether you're, whether, no matter where you're at, no matter what state of being you're in, whether you're on earth or whether you're in heaven, your goal is to live for the Lord and live a life pleasing to him. That's it. So the goal does not change. The goal is the same here on earth right now, and the goal will be the same when you die and go bye-bye. It is exactly the same. We are doing it exactly the same. It doesn't change. We want to live lives that are pleasing to him. That is our highest ambition. That is our highest ambition. And this is not something that is drudgery. This isn't, oh, I gotta, I gotta, it's over for me. Go have fun, everybody. I gotta go live for God now. No, it's not drudgery. It's something that you're passionate about because of what he has done for you. You're passionate about it. It's something that, that you're stirred up to do. You're zealous. So, you look for opportunities to please the Lord. Isn't, that's just a totally different way of thinking, isn't it? When was the last time you thought, you know, I need to look for opportunities to please the Lord? When was the last time that phrase went through your brain in between your ears? It doesn't happen too often, does it? But let it start happening more and more often now. Hey, what can I do that would be pleasing to the Lord here? Sometimes to do what's pleasing to the Lord is to not do something. And sometimes the most pleasing thing to the Lord is to do something. See what I mean? You look for opportunities to live your life for him instead of for yourself. We're really good at living for ourselves. You don't have to practice that. That comes naturally. You live for yourself naturally. It comes easy. You have to practice and work at this. You want to please God in all areas, don't you? Don't you want to do that? Is, is he not your greatest treasure? Well, then let's start living like it. So that people don't, so that when we bump into people, whether they're strangers or close acquaintances or people who kind of know us, that they have absolutely no doubt who we love and live for the most. Like what is, the, what is our greatest treasure to us? Oh, I love my family, but let it be said of me that I love Christ far more. Oh, I, I, love, I love lots of different things, but let it be said of me that I love Christ far more. Let that be my identity, be Christ and his gospel. Why do we do all this? We do all this because of our love for him, but we also do all this. is talking about like, how do you live for Christ? You've believed in him. This is talking to believers. So this is under the assumption that you have heard the gospel and you have received it. You heard it. You believed it. You put your faith in Christ. It's, that is assumed here, okay? So it's talking to believers. This is a message that Paul is writing to believers here. So it's assumed that you believe in Christ. It's assumed that you have faith. So then the next question is, well, now what? Right? If you have the faith and you've been saved, now what? Well, now you live for him. <laughs> now you live for him. Now you serve him. You live for him. And here's the cool part. God has already established your salvation. That's done. It is finished. It's been accomplished by Christ. Your sins have been put on him. The atonement, the justification, all of it complete and done. That's all finished. And God has given each of us that gift. And so that's all done and finished. And then he says, now so I have done this. Now serve me live for me and here's the here, here's what's cool about that he's already given us a great great gift of salvation hasn't he it's the greatest gift that could be given 
is salvation. He, he's already given us that gift. And then he says, now come and serve me, but I won't let you serve me without rewarding you. <laughs> Does he owe us anything? No. Do we owe him everything? Yes. Yet in spite of that, he still says that when you serve me, I will reward you for that. So you're not just serving them out of some kind of drudgery. You're serving them out of love, but you also know that there comes reward with that service. You, you will not be left in a negative uh, account status with the Lord. He will always outdo you. So as much as you serve him, he will outdo you in the blessing. So we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must appear before the judgment seat of Christ as believers, but in the judgment seat of Christ here is not judgment over sin. This is a different type of judgment. When you pass from this world to the next, you will give an account for what you have done, whether good or bad. But this accounting is not having anything to do with your salvation. That's been accomplished. That's done. This is not the great white throne judgment. Okay? You're not standing before the Lord at the great white throne judgment as a sinner would. You're standing before the Lord here, and he is, this is the Bema seat. This is the Bema seat of Christ where he's judging your actions, your actions for reward, not for salvation. That's already been accomplished. That's already done. This is for reward. So again, this is not the great white throne judgment mentioned in Revelation 20. This is a judgment of the works of the believers. Did you know that? Did you know that that's, that that's going to happen? That Jesus is going to judge our works. That he's going to look at what we have done with the time that he has given us. And he's going to judge that. Things done in the body. He's going to judge those things, what we have done, whether they be good or bad. The bad stuff, burned up, gone away. Nothing comes of it. No reward, right? You wouldn't expect a reward for the bad, right? But the good stuff that you've done in the body, there will be reward. And that's the idea, that this is the beam of seed of Christ. This is the, the judgment step, a raised up platform that Jesus is, is sitting upon and is judging the works that you have done in this life. Now that you understand and know that that's a real thing and that's going to happen one day, doesn't that inspire you to do more too? It's, it's, it's human nature, even for believers. If you know that the owner of a business never comes around, you grow lax, don't you? You take advantage of loopholes. You, you grow lax. You, you just don't hold yourself to a very high standard. But what if you knew that the owner was going to see everything you've ever done? That he had the most high-tech camera system ever made, and he saw and heard everything you ever think, said, and did in that business, and you knew that that was going to be judged one day. And you would be not punished for the bad, but the bad would get you nothing. Punishment for your bad and for your sins and all that already accomplished on the, on the cross, right? So this is just about rewards. And so wouldn't, wouldn't that knowledge make you act better, live better, be a more model employee? We're in that situation, guys. We're in that situation. He's going to judge over us. We must all, all believers must appear before the judgment seat, this type of judgment. Again, not the great white throne judgment. That's for unbelievers. This is the judgment seat of Christ. What will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ? Well, this is a judgment for believers and for the things that we have done. And also our motives. God knows that too. So he will be judging what we've done and why we did it, whether good or bad. So it behooves, because this is reality, it behooves us to live in a way with the understanding that we will be judged. But we're not judged like unbelievers are judged. That would be, that would be horrible, right? We're judged in a different way. You have a, your soul is saved, but you can still waste your life. That should, that should calm you on one hand. Oh, my soul is saved. Thank you, Jesus. And that can never be undone. Thank you, Lord. But now my biggest concern is that I do not waste my life. 
that how you live your life will be what is judged at the judgment seat of Christ. That should inspire you to service to the Lord. Because not only are you going to have to, to stand there before him and give answer for it, but it is all about reward. So this is, this is, there's a goodness here. He's going to reward me for all my good work? Yes. All those times I scrubbed the toilets at church? Yes. <laughs> I didn't want to scrub toilets at church. Yes, but you did it, didn't you? Yes. So, is God going to let that go? No, you can't do any ounce, not even one iota of service to the Lord without him seeing it, knowing it, and rewarding you for it at that time. You will be rewarded. This is why, the, so look, let's say two believers, both Every believer is equally saved, right? So you have two believers. They're both equally saved. One lives their life for Jesus Christ, sacrificing at a, at a huge level. They, they, you know, they proclaim the gospel. They evangelize to the people around them. They serve Christ, and they live for the life to come. And then you have this other believer who, you know, every once in a while, they might say a prayer before they eat. And they do a little bit here and there, just not a lot. You know, every once in a while, they kind of do something like that. Now, imagine, they're both saved, so they both enjoy the same salvation. They both go to heaven. But imagine if God gave them both the same types of rewards. You would say, that's not fair. You'd say, that's not just. This person lived their entire life with sacrifice and with great um, attention to what they did for the Lord, and this person kind of wasted many, many, many opportunities. Would it, wouldn't it not be unfair if God gave them both the same rewards as well as the same salvation? The same salvation is assured for every single believer, but not the additional rewards on top of that. And this is where God is just. When, somebody, when, when, when the scriptures say that this person will give fruit 30, 60, or 100 fold, who's going to get more eternal rewards, the 100 fold or the 30 fold? Well, the 100 fold, although they both be saved. Do you see what I'm saying? So God rewards your service to him, which is another encouragement to serve the Lord. What he's done for us and our, his love for us and our, now our love for him is an encouragement to serve the Lord. The fact that we're going to be judged is an encouragement to serve the Lord. In Hebrews 6.10, it says, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor, which you have shown towards his name. He knows. Paul it's a perfect example of this. He knows that all the troubles of his life, everything that he's gone through, the beatings, the, the people wanting to murder him, all of this stuff, that everything he's doing is worth it because he will be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Isn't that great? You can't, you can't lose by serving the Lord. You live with an understanding that your actions will be judged, your inactions will be judged, and your motives will be judged. And, they'll, and, and here's the thing. That judgment seat of Christ, the bad gets burned up and thrown away. Okay? There's no punishment. It's not a, when, when we hear the word judgment, we think punishment. Okay? The judgment seat of Christ is him observing and looking at everything that you did. He already knows it. And him rewarding you for the good and him doing away with any of the bad. So you get nothing for the bad and you get nothing for the inaction, but you get rewarded for the good. But this is in and above your salvation. One can do the right thing with the wrong heart. God knows the difference. Somebody can know the right thing and not do it. God knows that too. So you want to make sure that you're serving the Lord and that you're doing it with the right motives, the right intention. This was explained by Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, where he speaks of a coming assessment of our work before the Lord. Uh, what we do will be tested by fire. And it's so important that you understand that this judgment that I'm talking about is a completely different judgment than the white throne judgment that unbelievers stand before God. You're, you're saved. You have faith in Christ, you're saved. That's done. You will not stand before the Lord and give an account for your sins. Those have been put on Christ. Praise the Lord. 
This is a different type of judgment seat. This is a judgment seat that Christ is looking at you and he is saying, I'm going to test everything that you've done in your body. It will be tested by fire and the purifying fire of God will burn up everything that was useless. The wood, the hay, the stubble, all that useless stuff, it'll burn it up and it goes away. But all the stuff that was done for the Lord in service to the Lord, well, that's like precious gold, precious, precious jewels, precious metals. You won't be punished for, for what was not done rightly for the Lord. They're, those things are just burned up. They're burned up. You, it's like you never did them. So they accomplish nothing, see? Which is what, what hey, do you, do you like doing a bunch of work and then not getting paid for it? Nobody likes that. So you want to make sure that the work you're doing is something that won't get burned up. You are rewarded for what lasts through that fire mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3. That's what you get rewarded for. And that's a reward that's on top of the same reward that every believer gets automatically, which is salvation. There will be people who get before this Bema seat of Christ Believers who will get before the Bema Seat of Christ who will think that they have done a lot of great things for the Lord and then come to find out that they really didn't do anything because it all got burned up. They, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, are still saved through the fire. They're still saved. But there's no reward for their works because all their works didn't pass the test. So you have to do work but it has to be the right work in order for it to get rewarded. Makes sense, right? My boss tells me what to do, and that's how I get paid. If I don't do what my boss told me to do, he shouldn't pay me because I didn't do the task that he said to do. So we want to serve the Lord, but we want to make sure we're serving him in the right way so that you get your reward. Standing before Christ in this Bema seat of judgment is a privilege. Don't look at this as a terrifying thing. This is a privilege. It's an assessment of your works. It's an assessment of your works. Perhaps you've, perhaps you've said, I feel like I do this and no one cares. Or I feel like I'm doing this and no one notices. This is the text that you hang on to. Knowing that, you know what? Even if no one else gives me an attaboy, even if nobody else pats me on the shoulder or gives me a cookie or gives me a gold star, even if nobody else does that, God is seeing what I am doing. I labor not in vain because he will reward me. So now it doesn't matter if anybody else notices because I know the one person who matters notices and sees all and he will not fail to reward what I did for him. Even though he doesn't owe us anything, does he? It's we who owe him. Yet look at how good and gracious and giving of a God we have that he would still reward and bless us for our service to him, even though he does not need to. That's just how good he is. He's going to assess our works and he's going to reward us accordingly. So know that this is a real thing. Know that this is going to happen. Know that these are the deeds in the body. This does not include your sins because their judgment took place at the cross. That's done and over with. So what did you do with your life? What did you do so that the, return, the eternal reward that comes above and beyond salvation is what applies there? What was useless and what was worthwhile? God will burn up the useless and he will reward the worthwhile. So don't live for this life. Live for the life to come and make sure that you're maximizing your potential for the life to come by living for him and serving him in worthwhile eternal endeavors. Instead of look at my collection of she shells. Seashells? Seashells. Or look at, look at this, I collected stamps all my life. What'd you do with them? Nothing. I passed away before I could give them to anybody or do anything with it. What a waste. What a waste of resources. What a waste of time. Use your resources. Use your time. Use your life. Use every breath to invest in the one who saved you. 
living for him, knowing that you're going to benefit from it for all eternity. For all eternity. Do you remember when banks in their savings account used to get like 3%, 5%, even some of them back in the day, 10% interest on your savings accounts and those kind of things, right? And so it paid to have money in those accounts. And now you're lucky if you get half a percentage point on any of these things. So it doesn't really pay to have to put your investment in those accounts, right? You want to look for an investment account that's going to, to reimburse you the highest amount possible. There is no better investment account than the one we're speaking of here, the eternal one, where God himself pays it out. So it's guaranteed and it will be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Now's your time to save. Now's your time to serve. Not later. Enjoy the, enjoy the earthly things, but glorify God in them and through them and invest your time, effort, and energy in the things of God so that you bless uh, his holy name, glorify his name, share the gospel, point others to Christ, and then get rewarded for those, ser- those actions and those services on the other side of heaven forever and ever and ever. Am I selling this well enough? Is this a strong enough pitch to live your life for the Lord and to, to take a reevaluation and be like, okay, I believe the Bible. I know what we just read. That is true. That's going to happen one day. I'm going to start living like that's going to happen one day. I hope, I hope that, that you're feeling this, believing this, hearing this, digesting this, all of it, because this is very, very real. It's very, very real. Verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is also known to your conscience. This is talking about the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. The fear of the Lord is here referencing reverence. The reverence for God. Because of our reverence for God, we're going to, we're going to live, and we're going to act, And we're going to do life and walk in our lives in such a way that we glorify God. That that's what we're going to do. And in doing so, you're also going to maximize your reward in heaven forever and ever. There is literally no reason not to do it, right? There's no reason for us not to live our lives that way. Knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing the reverence we have for the Lord, we persuade others. We, we, we preach the gospel. We talk about Christ. We talk about the integrity of Christ. We talk about the honor of Christ. We want them to hear what we're saying, and we want to persuade them into believing what we believe. Why is he saying that? He just got done talking. Here's where context comes in handy. He just got done talking about eternal reward, right? Talking about the judgment seat of Christ, that all believers are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be rewarded for the, rewarded for the good and the bad stuff gets burned up and tossed out. As, as believers of the gospel and preachers of the gospel who are seeking to persuade others, they want to be able to make sure that these people are believers. I want to put forth effort and and strength and energy in serving the Lord by preaching his gospel and persuading others to believe in him so that they count towards my eternal reward. That's what he's saying. If, If they leave my teaching and they go if i'm a true teacher and they leave the teaching that i'm giving they go a bunch over to a bunch of false teachers and they stay there i will not receive any kind of reward for that right god will say here's a reward for being faithful and sharing the gospel right but i'll receive a greater reward if those people stay and and are and are growing so that's the idea here is he saying that i i want my eternal reward is affected by whether or not you stay in the faith or not. I will have a greater eternal reward if you stay in the faith. So then I effort to persuade you to stay in the faith because it benefits you and it benefits me, right? 
That's what he's saying there. That's what he's saying there. Believe the truth about Jesus Christ and believe the truth about me that I am teaching you correctly. People who really love God are drawn towards truth and they're drawn towards teachers who teach the truth. It's the people who stay, if they don't love God and they don't want to love God and they're not interested in the things of God, that's why people stay underneath false teachers because they don't love God and they don't want to love God. They are getting their ears tickled. They're getting their itch scratched. They're in it for themselves. But when you truly love God, you love his truth and you love those who teach his truth and you are drawn to it like a moth to a flame. So, we know because of the terror or the fear of the Lord, there's a reverential fear of the Lord for believers and there's a terror of the Lord for unbelievers. We want to persuade men. We want to persuade men to be believers in Jesus so that you no longer have a terror fear of the Lord, but a reverential fear. We want to do that. We want people to be delivered from the terror of the Lord. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And then when you come to Jesus, live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. And then when you die, die for Jesus. Die for Jesus. And then you're going to live forever and ever for yourself? No, for Jesus. In perfect harmony, joy, and bliss forever and ever and ever. Persuade men. Persuade those around you. Be like Paul, who passionately desired that people would come to Jesus, knowing that they benefit from that. And also knowing that he would also benefit from that. Why did Paul do all the things that he did? Why would he endure all these things? Because of the love of Christ and because of what was promised. He believed, and so he lived it out. And we need to do the same thing. You're, you're going to increase people's um, ability to believe by your own integrity and by your effort and your work. People could look at Paul and say, this must be real. Look at Paul. Look at what he's gone through. Look at what he's given up. Look at how he's changed from who he was to who he is now. And do you see how Christ is glorified in all of that? And you look at the life of Paul and how he sacrificed and all he did for the Lord and, and he wasn't bragging about any of it. He did it because of the love for the Lord, the love that the Lord showed him first and, and then that bred a love for him to the Lord, a love for the Lord's people, a love to share the gospel and to see people saved and transformed. But he also knew that all of the suffering was a light affliction in comparison to what was coming. All the reward that's coming. And it's going to last forever and ever and ever. All the persecution, all the light affliction, you know, you say, but, but I only have one life. And if I live it for the Lord, I'm not going to get to necessarily do all the things that I want to do. You won't be disappointed. If you trade all those things in that you want to do for you and you instead live your life for Christ, I guarantee you that he will reward you in such a way that you will not regret it. Paul knew it. Paul lived with, with that being an expectation, not a hope, an expectation. Verse 12, we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Was Paul just bragging? Was he just trying to glorify himself before the Corinthians? No, no, no. Paul glorified, gloried in the, his weakness, in his struggles. He's not trying to brag. Instead, he's telling his weakness and his trials and his struggles, and they're giving, he's giving them an opportunity to glorify God on his behalf. Look at how weak Paul is. Oh, Paul is so weak. It's got to be the glory of God that's seen him through all this. Do you see? Every time somebody tries to say, oh, Michael, I really enjoyed this, or you're really so good at that and everything, and, and you just deflect 
The con- you know, thank you for the compliment, but you end up giving Christ the glory. That's, that's it. I want you to see me as weak and as, as, as helpless so that you see that it is by the power and the grace of God so that God gets glorified. The Corinthian Christians weren't necessarily interested in glorying Paul, glorifying Paul, or in seeing anything good about his trials. They were thinking, remember, they were being told that all oh, his trials make, uh, make it look like he's not a real man of God because look at all the hard things he's going through. If he was really a man of God, oh, things would be easy. That's what they were thinking. But Paul knows better, so he's giving him this opportunity to glorify God on his behalf. Look at how much I've gone through. Look at how weak I am. Look at how, look at how poor I am. The only way I can maintain my service to the Lord is through his power and his strength. Now go and glorify the Lord on my behalf and, and glorify him for what he has done for me. See, he doesn't build himself up at all. He, he lowers himself so that God is glorified. And he gives the Corinthian Christians an opportunity to glorify God too by saying, yeah, I'm weak. Yeah. That's why, and, and I, yeah, I've been through a lot of trials and tribulations. And the only way that I've stayed faithful through it all is by God's grace. Glory be to God. Now you glorify him too. One problem with the Corinthian Christians is that they liked those who had all the trappings on the outside, right? No trials, no tribulations. They, they dressed well, had a pretty smile, had a good amount of uh, product in their hair, and they were always looking good. Sounded good, looked good. They glorified in their appearance, but nothing was in their heart. That was one of the problems in the Corinthian church is that they fell for those kind of folks, those kind of shysters. And there are plenty of them out there today who have nothing that glorifies God in their heart whatsoever. But the outside appearance looks good, sounds good, looks good, is is appealing to the eye. But there's nothing there in the heart. They looked down on Paul because his glory was not in appearance. His glory was in the heart. He truly glorified God in the heart. He didn't have a a beautiful appearance. The world didn't like his appearance. And Paul wasn't concerned about his appearance. He was concerned about what was in his heart. False teachers are just the opposite. They don't care about what's in their heart. They just want you to buy whatever their outer billboard is selling. So God is... Yeah, God is telling the Corinthian Christians through Paul that this is how he works. This is how God works in struggles and in trials and in tribulations. Because there are those who take pride in their appearance more than they care about what's inside their heart. And Paul is saying, that is not me. That is not me. What do you glory in? Remember, the Lord told Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, the Lord does not see as a man sees. The the Lord looks beyond outward appearance. The Lord looks to the heart. That's what the Lord looks to. Don't be a fool and look on the outward appearance. Look to the heart. We can be too impressed too easily by someone's image rather than caring about what is their substance, what's in the heart. Verse 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Uh, Paul isn't crazy. He's saying, I am motivated by the love of the love of God that I have received. To be beside yourself is to be called crazy. You say, oh, I'm just beside myself. You ever use that phrase? Oh, I'm just beside myself right now. It means I'm irrational. I'm feeling crazy. And that's what the Corinthian Christians thought. They thought, uh, Paul might be crazy. He might be crazy because he seems to be perfectly fine with this life of trials and pain and tribulation. Would you think that? 
if I started talking this way, and I started saying, you know, if, you, if I had a bunch of trials and tribulations just happen one after another after another, and, and I just keep praising God and glorifying God and seeing God in all of it, would you have that little voice inside your head saying, man, is he crazy? Is, is he crazy? Because he seems content despite all this bad stuff. See, that's what the Corinthian Christians were thinking. Is Paul crazy? He seems content with this life of discomfort and pain and trials. And here's the thing. Paul was comfortable with it because it brought glory to God. He was living for God. Again, with that big scale in your mind's eye that these temporary afflictions are light when you compare them to what awaits in heaven. The reward that awaited Paul in heaven was far greater than what he was suffering here on earth, and he knew it. And so he was completely comfortable as long as it brought glory to God. He was being accused of, of being crazy, and while well, he was in good company, Jesus was accused of being out of his mind. Many times, genuine believers are accused of just that. You're crazy. So he's saying, if we're beside ourselves, if we're crazy, it's for God. <laughs> it's for God. If we are of sound mind, well, it's for you. I'm not deliberately acting in a way that you think I'm crazy just for the sake of acting crazy. I'm doing it for God. If you want to think I'm of a sound mind, then you can think I'm acting that way for you. That's what he's saying. But he's not crazy. He's not crazy. He's quite sober-minded. For the love of Christ is what compels us. Paul's motivation, what pushed him on, was the love of Christ. That is, the love of Jesus and Jesus' love towards him. He had to do He was compelled. I have to do it. I have to. You're compelled. I, I must. I must. I must do it. I've received so much love from him. I must. I am compelled to serve him. I must do it. I cannot help myself. It is a, a great foundation. I must give because Jesus gave me everything. I must respond in kind. Paul felt compelled by the love of Christ. If somebody was to go to him, why do you do all this? He could say, I have to because of my love for Christ. Yeah, you've heard through, there's been enough movies and books and, and shows where it's like, love will make you do crazy things, right? Well, there is no greater love than the love of Christ. And it will make you do things that the world will say are crazy, but they're not crazy. I have, I have received the love of Christ. I must love him back with my heart. I'm compelled by the love of Christ to love Christ and to love those he loves. That is my desire. That is what I am. That is what motivates me is love. You also have the motivation of you know it's right to serve, right? You know that he, what all he's done for you. And you also have the, the knowledge of the rewards that wait for you. So that's part of it. But what's the driving force? What's the number one thing? Love. The love of Christ compels us. Compels us. It says, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right minds, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, compels us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he who died for all and those who live might no longer live for themselves. You no longer live for yourself, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. You no longer live for yourself. You live for Christ, the one who died and was raised. Count the cost. Count the cost. I want to be a believer. I want to have, put my faith in Christ. Okay, count the cost. Count the cost. Understand that Christ's substitutionary death he was the one who died for all. He died in place of all he came to save. Know that. Know that, that God's wrath against sin required death. Jesus 
was that substitutionary death on your behalf and on my behalf. And so then he justified or made us right in the eyes of God as a perfect sacrifice. He was our substitute. And so then everyone who dies in Christ lives in Christ. That's the idea. And Paul is so grateful for this. He is so overwhelmed by God's gracious action of Christ's love for him that now he is saying all who died in Christ will live with him and this is why we do what we do. It's because it's such a great thing. All the labor of all the apostles and all the genuine believers of Christ who labor hard for him, all of it comes or springs from that love of Christ. That's where it comes from. Jacob toiled for Rachel. And boy, did he, he got worked over, didn't he? He toiled for Rachel. Why? Because he loved her. And the love we have for Christ is far greater. The love of Christ has that power that it compels you to serve him. It compels you. The love of Christ presses you to service. That's why sometimes you need to be reminded of that love of Christ so that you wake up and realize, I, I've been asleep. I've, I've, somehow, I have been living my life as if the love of Christ is not the most important thing to me. I, I, I have to rearrange. He died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That's what we do. If Jesus died for us, it's only fitting that we live for him and die for him. Are you living for yourself? Or are you living for Jesus? You don't need to tell me. You need to look at yourself in your mind's mirror. Look at yourself square in the face. And you ask yourself, am I living for me or am I living for Jesus? And, and you do that in every segment of your life. You can do that in the whole. It's like, as a whole, am I living for me? Or as a whole, am I living for Christ? And you can do that for all the individual little segments of your life. If your life is a waffle, an ego waffle, and each, little life is a, each part of your life is a little compartment, you take every one of those compartments and you say, is this compartment living for me or is this compartment living for Christ? And you act accordingly. You act accordingly. Are you living for yourself or are you living for Jesus? He died for us so that we might die to ourselves. He didn't live so that you could live however you wanted. He didn't die so you could live however you wanted. He died so that you would die to yourself. That's the whole idea of baptism. Death to self and being reborn, born again. God created us for the purpose of living for him and not ourselves. What's, let me ask you this. What's the world around us doing? Is the world around us living for God or living for themselves? You know the answer. The world around us is living for themselves. Are you supposed to be like the world? No. So we're not supposed to live for ourselves. It's a corruption. It's a corruption of our original nature to live for ourselves and not for the Lord. In Revelation 4.11, God says, You have created all things for the pleasure, for His pleasure. God created all things for what? For His pleasure they were created. And we are part of that creation to live unto God, not unto ourselves. What does it mean to live no longer for ourselves, but for God? Our love for God and our life for God is expressed in the way that we serve Him and serve others. That's it. We live for Him. We live for Him. Verse 16, last verse. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard Him thus no longer. Uh, Paul no longer takes and measures people according to worldly standards. I'm no longer doing that. 
I, 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 don't, I don't do that. Therefore, from now on, uh, we regard no one according to the flesh. That's not how we judge. I don't judge according to the worldly standards. I don't judge according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we don't regard him that way any longer. I know, I know Christ in a totally different way now, is what he's saying. You don't look at the things that are seen, you look at the things that are not seen, right? That was 2 Corinthians 4, 18. We don't look at the things that are seen, we look to what is unseen. We know that our earthly tent will be destroyed, but we'll have a new body, an eternal body in the heavens forever and ever and ever. We walk by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We do not glory in appearance, but we glory in the heart, 2 Corinthians 5. That's where we find it. For all those reasons, we don't look to the image and the appearance of the flesh, but we look to the heart. Spiritual things. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we, them, uh, we know him no longer that way. They knew Christ in the flesh, but found a new relationship with him spiritually. A greater relationship. You might have fleshly heard of you Before you were saved, you knew of Jesus in a fleshly way. But once you got saved, once he regenerated you and saved you, you know him in a whole other way, don't you? That's what this means. You know him in a whole other way. You don't know him by the flesh any longer. Now you know him by a greater way. Deep inside the heart. That's what this means. That's what this means. To know Jesus in the flesh is nothing compared to knowing him in the heart, knowing him spiritually. There was a lot of people who knew him in the flesh and followed him in great numbers, yet deserted him and went away because he wasn't deep inside the heart. We know him, we, we know him in a far more intimate and better way. This is, and, and we know him in that way even more because we have the gift of God's Holy Spirit now indwelling us. That's why Jesus said in John 16, it's to your advantage that I go away so that I can send the helper. If I depart, I will send him to you. And that helper is the Holy Spirit who helps us to know Jesus in a far more greater way than just the way somebody can know him in the flesh. We'll stop there for today. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, help us. I, when I look at myself honestly in my mind's eye, oh, how weak I am, how foolish I am, how, how easily I get tied up in the things of the world and distractions of the world instead of living my life for you. You died for me. Should it be so hard for me to die for you? And then to live for you. You lived for me too. You lived a perfect life of righteousness we could never do. And you died for us as our substitutionary atonement on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, taking upon yourself the wrath of the Father. So Lord, help us because we are not who we should be. We do not live for you in the, in the same perfect way that you lived for us. And, but Lord, we don't want to be hypocrites. We pray that you would use your Holy Spirit that indwells all of us who you have saved to make us into your image and that you would make us faithful and make us obedient to your word and, and make us die to self, pry our fingertips off the things of this world that so easily entangle us. And instead, Lord, wrap our, our arms around you and the things of, of your word and, and help us to live lives pleasing to you. Change us. Change us, mold us, make us into, into people that will have great reward one day when we stand before you at the Bema seat, that, that you will stand before you saved, each and every one of us. But Lord, help us to stand before you that from this moment on, through the rest of our lives, that you would make us more effective and put forth greater effort and service towards you so that we might have more reward when we stand before you in heaven. Father, all these things, we, we put all of ourselves in your mighty hands and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thoughts, questions, prayer requests.